Welcome to The Healthy Advisor, a podcast from wealthmanagement.com focused on advisors' personal well being and healing. I'm Diana Britton, managing editor of wealthmanagement.com. And in this podcast, we explore some of the struggles and personal development issues facing advisors and financial services professionals, and how to get to a place of healing for mind, body, and spirit. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of the Healthy Advisor podcast. Thanks for joining us. I'm Diana Britton, the managing editor of wealthmanagement.com. And as you may know, this podcast is focused on personal well-being and healing in the financial services industry. Guests join me to talk about their journey dealing with a struggle and how they found healing. And Today's guest definitely uh, counts on that score. Um, my guest today is Anthony Zhang. He's the CEO and co-founder of VinoVest, a platform aimed at democratizing access to investing in fine wine. Anthony, thank you so much for joining me today. Diana, thanks for having me on board. Yeah, it's an um, interesting company. I'd love to, we'll, we'll hear more about that in a minute. But um, so Anthony's built three businesses, um, you know, the, the latest of which is, is VinoVest, the tech platform for investing in fine wine. And, you know, many of his clients are financial advisors. Uh, but in 2016, Anthony was in the midst of building his first company, which is called Envoy Now, an on demand food delivery service. He pitched and secured investment from Mark Cuban and Mark Burnett and received a $100,000 fellowship from billionaire Peter Thiel to drop out of college. But at a party one night that year, he jumped into swimming pool headfirst, leaving him paralyzed from the neck down. Huge li- uh, life-changing event for you, um, Anthony, but um, we'll, we'll get to that in, in a minute. Um, but tell me a little bit about your background, the the three three businesses you've built, and how you came to establish VinoVest. Yeah, so I think when it comes to my uh, entrepreneurial journey, I'd always known that I wanted to build a business someday. Um, I just didn't really know the path that it would take to get there. You know, when I first started college, I thought I needed to get a four year degree and go into get some work experience and come back and get an MBA and then maybe then I'd be ready to start a business. But turns out two months into my freshman year of college, my food delivery app idea, Envoy Now, um, really just, it really took off. Um, It was kind of like an early Postmates or Grubhub where students would be able to deliver food to other students via our app, giving on one side college students an easy way to make some extra cash and then on on the other side um, a lot of hungry students and teachers who are stuck in study halls with the dorms um, getting convenient food deliveries from their peers Uh, so that was really the basis of envoy now and really i think when things started to change for me and the business was when we had that opportunity to pitch mark cuban mark burnett and after securing that funding offer, that was when things changed. Like the business really hit an inflection point. I started to take it more seriously than just a college side hustle and went full time on it. As you mentioned, I dropped out of college to take the Teal Fellowship and really never looked back from that point in terms of knowing with 100% certainty that building businesses was what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Yeah, tell us a little bit about what it was like to to pitch Mark Cuban and, and Mark Burnett. I know I was watching the clip, and it's pretty funny. I guess I don't know. Uh, Mar- you know, Mark Cuban is can be a little scary. Um, so I I don't know what was it like. You know, being up there on stage and, and pitching them to to them. Yeah, so um, he had come to our school as a guest speaker. And I was just in the audience. I had no really expectation of being able to even talk to him, let alone pitch him my business. But at yeah. the end of the end of the speech, our, our dean had recommended uh, Mark Cuban. He's like, "Hey, we got some extra time here. You've got your executive producer Mark Burnett on board. Why don't we just do a live Shark Tank college style?" And 
I was one of the students that was waving their hands like crazy trying to get a chance to pitch him. And luckily I was chosen from the audience. And um, as you mentioned, you know, pitching a shark can be pretty scary, especially um, when you're not prepared. And I had seen the company that had pitched him before me just absolutely get torn to pieces by Mark. You know, he was, if anyone has watched Shark Tank, you know how some of these sharks can be. They get really ruthless, dive into numbers, you know, tear everything apart and, and really shred your pitch and your confidence. Um, so after seeing that, what happened to the, the entrepreneur before me, I knew I had to really take a stand and be a lot more confident than I was really feeling. Um, so as you can see in, in the video clip, I, instead of just standing up and pitching him, I, I sat right next to him on the couch and pitched yeah. in my idea. And, um, in the middle of the pitch, Mark Burnett had, had given me an offer. He was like, Hey, do you want, you know, do you want a hundred thousand dollars? Right. Yeah. 5%. And I was like, Holy crap. If uh, I'm getting offered this, that was in, at the time I was 19 years old. That was probably the biggest number I could think of at the time. I was like, Oh my God, for 5% that, that makes my company worth more than a million dollars. That's a huge number. Um, and I took it and Mark Burnett and, uh, Mark Cuban decided to go in on it 50, 50. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I actually, I had the opportunity to, to interview Kevin O'Leary one time and he was actually super nice. I mean, like, you know, obviously I'm not pitching him anything, but, um, just, he was just super nice and down to earth. Um, but anyways, um, so I know, um, you know, in 2016, you were in a terrible accident. Um, take us back there. What, what happened? So 2016, so this was about uh, three and a half years into running Envoy now. We'd already raised some venture capital funding and you know things were really taking off. We were um, looking to also raise a subsequent round of funding um, on a weekend trip. had gone to uh, a pool party and dove into the pool, misjudged where, what I was doing and immediately hit the bottom and broke my neck on impact. And that also damaged my spinal cord, which led to me becoming a quadriplegic instantly. Um, mm. So I couldn't move anything below my neck. I was just floating in the water. And I really don't remember much from that night because of the shock. But next thing I do remember is having to have multiple surgeries to, to stabilize my neck, fuse my spine, and really being, being in a position where I was fighting for my life in the ICU for, for five weeks, actually. I was on a ventilator, just trying to get to be in a more stable place so I could even start my rehabilitation. And I spent the rest of uh, rest of that year, almost almost another year in rehab, uh, just relearning everything from weaning off of a ventilator and breathing on my own to something as simple as even learning how to pick up a utensil again to be able to write or be able to use my phone and even be able to chew and eat again. Um, so my life completely changed, my priorities completely changed. And for me, it was really a moment where I realized that you can have all of the success in the world, but if you don't have your health, non nothing matters. Hmm. Yeah. What was going through your head, you know, during those five weeks in the ICU and, and that year in rehab? What was, what were you thinking about? At first, I really didn't know the severity of the injury. Um, I had really never known anyone else who had a spinal cord injury. I did not know much about what the extent of that meant. And I thought, you know, oh, maybe it's just it's like a broken leg or, and you know, and any sort of sports injury where you can just recover and, and be all good in a few weeks. That wasn't the case. Having a spinal cord injury is a, a really permanent condition and the spinal cord doesn't really heal like the rest of your body does. Um, and I think that realization, realizing that I, I was going to live the rest of my life in a wheelchair, I was going to be disabled and have to adapt in a lot of different ways that I'd never even considered that realization left me in a place where I was really just struggling with what the rest of my identity was, right? I was very active. Uh, loved going out, loved seeing friends, loved, 
you know, hiking and things like that. And those were all things that I was like, I, I'll never be able to do again. What am I going to do when I'm in a, you know, in a wheelchair in a hospital bed for the rest of my life, staring at a ceiling? Um, mm. And then another statistic that really hit me hard was that over 80% of people who suffer a spinal cord injury never, ever go back to work again. Um, and that was something that I think I just really kept on rolling through my head. And I was like, that can't be me. Right. I, mm. I love, I loved what I was doing at Envoy now. I loved being at the helm of a company and, and building a business and seeing the real world impact my business had on other people. Um, and I realized that, you know, if I didn't have that part of my life, not at least not being able to challenge myself mentally, um, that was something I could not give up. Um, and that's really where I started focusing my energy when I moved to rehab was when I was doing physical therapy and occupational therapy during the day. Um, that was one sort of recovery for me. And then during my off hours, during my lunch breaks and after, you know, after the afternoon, after all my therapies were done, um, I'd be starting to go back to the business and think about ways that I could still help my company. And that was another form of therapy to help me really come to grasp with what had happened with my injury and still realizing that there is a path for me to really still be able to do a lot of things that I used to do. Yeah. What happened with the company when you were in rehab? I know you got a call from your co-founders at some, at one point. Yeah. So this was about, um, I want to say four months into my injury. So I, you know, pretty much not had any contact with the outside world. I did not use my phone for the first four months because I was really just in denial of what actually happened and trying to process it myself. And I was pretty shocked when I got that phone call from my co-founders who were running the company at the time in my absence. And they're like, Hey, um, we want to just return all the money back to our investors and, and kind of fold it over. You know, it's really not, um, going in the direction that they had hoped. And that's when I was really forced to make a decision, right? Should I just let it happen? Everyone would understand, you know, the CEO had a really traumatic accident and is not able to run the company. Um, but something inside me just didn't want to give up. I wanted to actually treat that as an opportunity and as a challenge to really rise up and get back to doing what I was loving to do. So when they left, I went to my board and I was like, Hey, I'm still in, still in rehab here, but, um, I'd love to be able to still run the company. I want to come back as CEO. We've had a lot of acquisition interest prior to my injury that we just always said no to because we were growing really quickly. But I think we owe it to both ourselves, our employees, as well as our shareholders to be able to turn this company around and get a successful exit. Um, and after I told my board that they gave me their blessings and talking to our executive team, I still remember that, that Zoom call where you know, I was still in the hospital on, on Zoom, seeing everybody for the first time and telling them that like, I wanted to come back and lead the company, but I really needed them to step up for me, right? I couldn't do a lot of the day-to-day -day executional and tactical items, but I could help with the strategy and leading the company to where I thought it deserved to be. And over the course of the next um, seven to nine months, we were able to achieve double digit weekly growth for, for 12 weeks straight at one point and get a few acquisition offers and ended up getting bought out by Joyrun, um, which is a company that's now a subsidiary of Walmart. Yeah, that's great. So you did, you did regain some, uh, movement in your, in your hands and arms or. Yeah. So I, I was lucky enough to regain some kind of just gross motor movement in my shoulders and arms. I still can't move any of my hands or fingers. Um, so today as I'm sitting here recording with you, I'm, I'm still in a wheelchair, but I'm able to learn how to use my, my phone, my computer and you know, everything I need to be able to work, um, with the, with the help of some adaptive tools. Hmm. Wow. Um, so I know, you know, one thing that you said to me um, was that, you know, being able to work was was really helpful during that time because it 
you know, made me made you realize that you you can still use your brain. You still have your brain and and your mind, and and that was, um, you know, a good thing. And you went on to to create more companies uh, after that, right? A couple, uh, I mean, including VinoVest. Yeah. So after after selling Envoy now, um, you know, was was just taking some time with the company that acquired us, but. Know Your VC, my second company, really came to me pretty unexpectedly. Um, this mm-hmm. was in 2017, you know, the time when um, you know the Harvey Weinstein scandal was going down in Hollywood, and at the same time in Silicon Valley, there was similar scandals happening where a lot of brave entrepreneurs from uh, who are either minorities or females were coming out and telling their stories of how these really high profile venture capitalists had um, sexually harassed them or were discriminating against them during pitch meetings and just a lot of these terrible, terrible things that came to light. And I just realized that there's such a similar power imbalance between, you know, big Hollywood directors and and actors, right? Because there's one person kind of making all the decisions and the other person is in a position where that's their livelihood, right? An entrepreneur mm-hmm. or an actor, that role could make or break their entire um, career. And same with a company, right? Securing funding can make or break the trajectory of your company. Um, mm-hmm. And realize that there should be a place where people can have a little bit more transparency into who these VCs really are, who these angel investors really are, and what they're like after you want them on your board or you want them on your cap table or even what it's like to pitch them. So Know Your VC is essentially like a Yelp, Glassdoor sort of model for people to be able to rate venture capitalists and and angel investors. And because of the social climate at the time, this was just started as a side project that me and a few friends put together over the course of a few weekends, but the site just blew up. We were having like hundreds of thousands of unique searches a month and a lot of people really utilizing the site because they wanted to know that sort of information and i think it was just really good timing yeah and and then what brought you to to establish vinovest i mean tell us a little bit about that because you know it's a little bit more relevant for our audience um you know financial advisors and i know you just launched a new app more for um, you know, I mean, it's something that that uh, advisors, clients, you know, maybe want to look into as part of their portfolio. Yeah, so VinoVest, um, I'd been investing in wine for several years and really started after I sold my first company, right? I'd like, like any entrepreneur after their first exit, one of the first things they do is go to a financial advisor. Um, and when I went to mine, he was like, this is great, Anthony. What do you want to do with the rest of your life, right? You're only 20-something years old. <laughs> Told him I wanted to build businesses for the rest of my life. Um, and he was like, well, that's that's pretty risky. So let's put this money that you have into something really safe and long-term. Um, and I just didn't really like the sound of that. I wanted something a little bit more exciting. So instead of doing that, I put my money into investing in my friend's startups, investing in cryptocurrency and real estate and also investing in wine. I remembered really just Googling alternative assets and some of the most high performing ones. And I was surprised to really see investing in wine and and in whiskey at the top of that list. I was like, whoa, I'd always been interested in wine. Didn't really know much about it, especially on the high end and the collectible end. But I always loved the idea of learning more. And I thought this could be a fun hobby where I could make some money doing it, but also learn more about the world of wine. Um, And Mm. when I was in that rabbit hole a few years ago, I just realized how inaccessible it was for an asset class that had been around for so long, right? You need a lot of expertise into knowing which wines are worth collecting, which wines will go up in value. You need a lot of infrastructure with actually being able to acquire the wine, ship them and store them properly. And then that there wasn't any sort of stock market or uh, open liquidity pool for people to be able to easily buy and sell. Um, and those things, I thought, hey, I could, I could solve that. 
I could be able to create a platform that can be able to make it easy and make it so that anyone or any advisor for their clients can be able to easily deploy their capital into a platform that handles everything, that gives you turnkey access to this great asset class that has proven to beat out global equities over the past few decades, that has about a third of the volatility over that same time period and has shown to be really low correlation as well. Um, and for those reasons, I thought that VinoVest should exist and that's what we are today. We're a wine investment platform. Um, you know, we have a retail side for you know the everyday investors who want to invest directly and then also work with a lot of advisors on helping them be able to put this into their clients' portfolios as well. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I mean, Anthony, just going back, you know, again, uh, you know, to the accident and how, how does your daily life kind of look different now? I mean, obviously there's a lot of limitations that you deal with that many of us uh, couldn't imagine, you know. Um, tell us about what that looks like. Yeah, so my, my daily routine is a lot different than it used to be. Um, but it really starts with having, I think, a lot more preparation for things that people usually take for granted. So, for example, you know, just even getting myself out of bed and getting ready, um, having a lot of help with you know, my wife, who is also my, my full-time caretaker, um, and getting me out of bed and ready for the morning, that alone is a process that takes two hours. So I need to wake up a lot earlier than I would usually. And the pandemic has really been a blessing for me because we've shifted everything to be online and mm. being able to work and take meetings and be able to do everything I need to do from my home office has definitely made things a lot easier than, you know, say if, if we were working in, you know, in a traditional office setting, I would need to find, you know, wheelchair accessible transportation, wheelchair accessible parking, get to the yeah. office and then really be able to make sure that the office is wheelchair accessible as well. And, you know, thankfully, uh, you know, pr prior to starting VinoVest, I worked in those environments before and um, I can still be able to contribute as as an employee in a normal office setting. But it's, it just it takes a lot more planning things. on my side. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. Just being at home and being able to do whatever I need to do really quickly because it's all set up, you know, even something as small as the height of the table or the height of my computer and just having everything in a familiar spot so I can be able to go through my daily routine in a way that is efficient and in a way that I don't need any sort of outside help um, to go about my day. That's that's really want what I want to continue doing so that I can be independent. Yeah. What are, what are some of the things that you'd like people out there to understand about being quadriplegic? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, for me, before my injury, I don't think I knew anything about spinal cord injuries or even noticed what, um, what people in wheelchairs go through on a daily basis. I think with a spinal cord injury, there's a lot of differences between even between being a quadriplegic, for me, I'm at the C5 level, which is a, a vertebrae on the cervical part of your spine. Um, mm. So if it's if it's a cervical injury, that means it affects all four of your extremities, so your legs as well as your hands and fingers. Um, so mm. for me, at the C5, that means that I can't move anything really below my chest, but I can really still be able to move my arms and be able to use some utensils uh, to attach to my hands to be able to grab things. Um, mm -hmm. For paraplegics, it's really that their um, their arms and fingers are not affected because it's at a lower part of their back, the injury. Um, okay. But there's still a lot of other challenges that um, are similar, and I think the main thing is around mobility, right? So if I were to take a flight to go to New York or San Francisco, um, the process of flying is... Uh, is something that I never really thought of before, um, before my injury, where you actually need to call the airline, make sure that they have an aisle chair because you have to switch out of your normal wheelchair to get into an aisle chair to fit inside the plane to even get to your seat. 
and then、mm. you need to actually check your wheelchair in. And a lot of times, there's horror stories of you know airlines damaging bags, right? Unfortunately, it happens a lot with with wheelchairs too. And imagine, you know, some hasn't happened to me, but some of my friends have gotten off a flight, and unfortunately, they've realized that they left the wheelchair at the you know、oh, at、God. the original. Point of、uh, departure, or that it got damaged, right? And when that、mm. is the only thing that you can have to be independent, that's a huge, huge problem, right? Because every every wheelchair is adapted to every person. They're all custom made, so it's not like you can just use another chair, right? It's and they're it's really fitted expensive, to your body, right? Yeah, like my my wheelchair costs more than you know an average car. And it is、wow. it is pretty crazy to think about it, and, and it's you know it's almost twenty thousand dollars, so、um, wow that that side too, like the whole medical side of it is a whole other whole other issue. But、um, thankful to thankful to still at least be in a position where I have have good insurance, you know, have the right equipment to enable my independence, and still be in a position where I can build a company from my home. Yeah, what did your? I guess I'm wondering. You know, how did your experience kind of shape who you are today and the work that you're doing today? I think when it came to building Vinovest and、um, even just choosing what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, I had a lot more perspective. Right, I starting a company is not easy.、Um, you go through a lot of emotional and physical and. Mental stress and pain,、um, and I knew that if I wanted to pursue that, it needed to be something long term. It needed to be something that I had a true passion for, and not just like a good idea that I could make a lot of money in. Right? There's a lot of good ideas, a lot of ways to make a lot of money, but you need to be connected on it on a different level. And at the time, wine was something that I was already spending a lot of time on outside my outside of my nine to five job. And it was really a hobby that was consuming more and more of my mind share, and I realized that if if I could turn this into a business and be able to work on something that I loved, which is you know combining alternative assets with technology with wine, it really was kind of a unicorn opportunity for me. And if you are able to do something that. You're looking forward to doing, no matter if it's a Monday or a Sunday or a Friday, then you're really lucky, right? That's really what my definition of success is, and that's why I've been able to run this company and and, and scale it and find so many passionate individuals because we're able to find something at the intersection of of their passion, something that they can make profit on, and something that does touch people in more ways than one. Yeah, well, you have a great attitude, Anthony.、Um, I it's I, I really admire you, and、um, you know I know that you you mentioned your wife. I think it's just amazing. Sounds like she sounds amazing in terms of just taking care of you, and also just I know that she was with you、um, on the night of the accident, and she's been with you、uh, ever since. Just sounds like a really great、uh, person to have in your life. Yeah, McKenna's incredible. We've, I mean, we've been dating since we were teenagers, so we have、wow. uh, really grown、High、up together. High school sweethearts.、Um, college sweethearts. So、oh, okay. pretty much the、Got、first、you. week of college,、um, she lived, I think, three or four doors down, and we just instantly. Became good friends and then started dating, and you know we recently got married last month. So she's she's been there through you know the pre envoy nowadays, the envoy nowadays, through the injury, through all of my recovery and and rehab, and through all of these companies. So she's、um, been a huge source of inspiration for being able to push myself in my personal life, in my physical therapy, and in in my business too. I'm、um, having her as essentially my my trusted advisor.、Um, she's thankfully shot down a a ton of my bad ideas in between company, <laughs> in between my companies. So、um, I'm very fortunate to be working on Renovest and not some other crazy idea because you know my mind works that way. And that you know one day I'll just see something and then just 
get sucked into a rabbit hole and spend the rest of the next few days researching, talking to potential customers, talking to industry experts and, you know, writing up a whole investment memo and prospectus for myself. And what I usually do is I present it to McKenna and 99% of the time she'll, she'll tear it apart for reasons A, B, and C. But when I presented VinoVest to her, she was like, Hey, that's actually not a bad idea. I, I would do it. And when I have that, uh, vote of confidence, that's when I knew I should charge headfirst into it. Yeah. Do you guys have any assets in VinoVest, like, or in, in the wine industry, I guess? Oh, absolutely. So about, about 10% of my investment portfolio is in wine. Um, the rest mm. is diversified across traditional equities and real estate and some crypto. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I mean, I could talk about crypto all day and, and all kinds of stuff, but um, we're just about out of time. But I'd like to thank my guest, Anthony Zhang, for being on the podcast and, and sharing his story. Anthony, thank you so much. Absolutely, Diana. It was a pleasure. If you'd like to reach out to Anthony, you can reach him at anthony at vinovest.co. Um, and if you yourself have a struggle or you, do, you wish to share your experiences and help others in similar situations, please feel free to reach out to me at diana.britton at informa.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to the Healthy Advisor podcast. If you've not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This is Diana Britton reminding you that where there's healing, there is hope. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The Healthy Advisor, a podcast focused on advisors' personal well-being and healing. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of wealthmanagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your particular situation.